how did you come by C.S. Lewis and were you at Oxford? Did you have any Oxford connections? No, no, I wasn't in Canada in Oxford at all. I came across C.S. Lewis, uh, like a lot of people, at 17 years old, I was given a copy of the Screwtape Letters. And then throughout um, the years, I read various bits and pieces about, from Lewis, mere Christianity and things like that in the Narnia books. Um, but um, I really got very involved with C.S. Lewis uh, in the mid-90s. I had come to um, America on a project for a British music company. Um, to, they wanted to set up a division here. I was here for on a two or three year contract. And nearing the end of that contract, I happened to come across a news bulletin or from a theatrical company that did all their performances in um, the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, which is the primary performing arts center in Nashville. And the bulletin um, had a little box ad in it, a display ad. Um, and it was for the play Shadowlands. Um, now, Shadowlands, if anybody doesn't know it, is really the story, the Hollywood version of the Jack and Joy story, C.S. Lewis, um, Joy Gresham, and that. And it's a, it's a great film, but it was also a stage play. In fact, it was a stage play before it was a film. It was a BBC television play, uh, uh, thing first. Anyway, the, 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 this theatrical company was put in on the stage version of Shadowlands. And the advert said, or the display ad said, auditions for Shadowlands, British accents are help. <laughs> I thought, well, I've got a British accent. I've had it for a number of years. So I called the number. I said, look, I've never been on stage before, but I do have a British accent. And um, I said, is there any point in me coming along? And they said, well, it's a sort of community theatre, so all comers welcome, really. So I went along and, and hoping I might get a small part, and to cut a long story short, I won the lead role of C.S. Lewis, and that's where it all started. And that was in the mid-90s. Other questions? The gentleman right here. There's a mic here if people want to come walk down to it. Yeah. Sir? Uh, I thought your comedic timing was excellent. I laughed a lot in this show, and thank you for that. Can you say something about how you developed that comedic timing in this show and how you made it so very funny? Well, uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, and, and I'd like to say it was all of my own making, but it wasn't. I wrote the show quite a number of years ago, and if you want to know why the timing is like it is now, and I'm glad it, you like it, and uh, it's because of the best directors I have ever had in all of my shows, and that is the audience. The audience tells you what works and what doesn't work. And I remember that I've learned so much with the audience, and I'll just give you one illustration. <clears throat> I was doing a show in Indianapolis, about 900 people in the Paramount Theater. Um, not Indianapolis, it was Alexandria, um, Indiana. And I had had an awful journey coming from England. There had been delays, um, whereas I should have got it at 6 o'clock at night. I got in at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was so tired. And I walked on stage. And as I walked on stage, my heart started to race. It was just like that. And I thought, goodness gracious, I'm never going to get through this. And it's, um, it was like somebody had drawn the breath out of my body. I was almost gasping for air. And I thought, well, you know, I'll do it, and I'll just have to stop if I can't do it. But what I will do is I'm going to have to slow down. I cannot do it at the, at the pace I, can, I normally do it. I'm just going to have to slow down. And so I did. And it was the best show I'd done up until that time. And the reason was because I slowed down. And that taught me that you need to be careful about how, how speedy you are and over the, since that time, the audience has showed me what works and what doesn't work, and that's allowed me to become where, where it's, it is now. Thank you for that. Um, first of all, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, the questions are, first, are you going to be back in San Francisco another time soon? Or? Well, 
That gentleman over there is the man you need to ask. He was the one that uh, brought us in here. So the answer is we hope we might come back with wardrobes and rings, uh, Lewis and Tolkien. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think I would probably suggest two books. Um, I would suggest Surprised by Joy, um, and that's not Joy Gresham. That was it, it, he talks about experiences he had as growing up, various experiences which he called experiences of joy. Um, but that book is about his early life and how he became a Christian. That's what I would suggest. And then the other book I would suggest is Mere Christianity, which is a wonderful book. Um, uh, which, which, you know, we all, those of us that are Christians, uh, uh, probably uh, are very familiar with so many truths of the Bible. But sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. And Lewis has a way of making us look at truth in a different way and helping us to, oh, yeah, that's wonderful. And so that's what I would do. I don't know whether you'd like to add to that. Well, I was going to suggest that um, in the program, um, there were uh, a number of areas that you might want to expand upon. Um, but one question I had is, what do you consider to be Lewis's greatest book overall? Well, it depends what you mean by greatest book. If you want to know what my favorite book, it's Till We Have Faces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite book, uh, the retelling of the Psyche Cupid myth. Yeah, that's the last novel that Lewis wrote, the one he said he was most proud of. And uh, it's a very, uh, very sophisticated novel, mm -hmm. right, to say the So least. that would be my favorite book. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was Lewis's favorite book, as, as David has said. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, I want to just say thank you. You've given me an amazing gift tonight. Um, thank you. Lewis has been my favorite author for decades. And uh, through reading so much of his work, uh, I feel like I've learned so much about him, but I also feel like he's a fellow introvert. And I was wondering if in all your research, um, if there's something you learned about him that, that maybe the average reader, or even the kind of in my case, excessive reader of, of Lewis wouldn't know about him, something that surprised you or you found remarkable uh, in your research? Um, there are little, lots of little things about Lewis. I mean, he didn't like spiders, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, that's a triviality. Um, I was, uh, one of the things that I've always admired about Lewis is that he um, gave many of his royalties away uh, from his books. He was a very generous man. They say you couldn't be in a room with C.S. Lewis for more than five minutes without there being raucous laughter. Um, and so, um, uh, to me, is he, he, he's just an intriguing character. Um, he wasn't perfect, but he was... Somebody once described him as one of the, the most thoroughly Christian men they'd ever met. Um, but um, I don't know whether that answers your questions, but there are little things about Lewis that uh, are really in, you know, interesting. Look. One thing I might add is Lewis, is estimated, gave away at least 70% of his, his income. Uh, he would have normally been a very wealthy man, um, but he, um, if someone requested support through the correspondence, he got massive correspondence, he would send a check. Um, he created ultimately a, a foundation called the Agape Fund, um, but in his own personal life, um, for most of the time, um, he didn't keep track of the money he gave away. And so he was always near um, to having serious trouble with the tax authorities because there was no record of the, the Im immense amount of wealth he gave away to people. Um, I really enjoyed the way that you brought C.S. Lewis to the stage, and I felt like I really did meet him. And um, I'm just curious how you came about uh, personifying him and how you decided on the mannerisms that you chose. Um, if on the, How I decided on what? On the mannerisms that you chose uh, to present C.S. Lewis. Like, is that based off of 
um, just your personal opinion or did you like, you know, listen to him or watch him and see how he acted? Yeah, there's very little. There's, I don't think there's uh, uh, hardly anything uh, recorded of Lewis. I do, I do remember um, his stepson was Douglas Gresham. And in the early years when I started off uh, doing this show, I, I, I spent some time with Douglas asking him about how I should p portray Lewis. One of the things I said to him is, um, should I try and Lewis, use Lewis's voice? Because there is some recordings of Lewis, not many, but there are some. And um, he said, no, don't. He said, especially if you're doing it in America, because Lewis had this sort of accent which was a, which was a cross between Irish, English, and the Oxford sort of dialect. And that would have made it difficult for people to hear. He said, just use your own voice. He said, the one thing about Lewis's voice, it was booming. And he said, you have a strong voice. So um, now in terms of mannerisms, no. What you're seeing is what I feel, um, not what I've seen. There was a question over here, I think. The only thing I would say about the mannerisms was v Lewis was very expansive in, in everything he did. You, he wasn't somebody who was just sitting back. So it, it, I, I tried to make sure that I'm not sort of laid back because Lewis wasn't. Thank you for a very enjoyable evening. I wanted to ask, did you compose the script yourself, first of all? And secondly, if so, uh, was there a reason that you said nothing about his m service in the First World War? Um, yes, I did write the script. My problem was uh, with the, uh, the war. Um, also, some people might say, why did I not mention uh, his adopted mother, as it were, Mrs. Moore, um, whom, who he looked after for so many years? Um, a part of it is there is only so much you can put in a play and there comes a point where there's too much and people uh, have had too much. I want them leaving, uh, to leave w wishing they'd had more, not wishing they'd had less. Also, Lewis's talk about the war was actually quite minimal in many ways. He didn't talk too much about it. Um, I mean, he talks about how he experienced the, uh, some of the things that were in it and it affected some of his yes. poems. Yes. But... Um, uh, and uh, so I, I think probably the, 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 the honest answer is I just had to decide what I was going to keep in and what I was going to keep out. Mm -hmm. I can tell you now that three years ago, if you'd have heard this play, you would have heard me talk about the war. But I took it out because I needed to keep the play at a certain length. Th those of you who don't know about both Lewis and Tolkien were in World War I. Both of them were seriously injured. Lewis almost died, and through the rest of his life, he had shrapnel in his body that was a handicap. Uh, he was almost killed. There was a, uh, a bomb that went off in the trench where he was, and it killed uh, the sergeant. He was a, he was a lieutenant. Um, but uh, the interesting story about the World War I is two things I would suggest. One is that it had a profound effect on Lewis and Tolkien's thinking. Um, and they're concerned about the rise of total war and the total state, because you have to realize that out of World War I came uh, the Bolshevik um, success, essentially, um, totalitarianism in Russia, and then led ultimately, within not that many years, to the rise of fascism. So, but the, the particular personal story that's worth, um, I think, mentioning is that uh, one of the, the uh, uh, people that Lewis met when he was in training was a young man named Patty Moore, and they were barracked at the same college at Oxford, and they made a pledge to each other that if one was killed and the other was not, that the one who survived would take care of the family uh, of the person who had, was killed. And this was a pledge that uh, Lewis took very seriously. Uh, his friend Patty Moore was killed, and Lewis then, as David said, uh, took the responsibility for the rest of the life of uh, Petty Moore's mother um, to take care of her. And uh, it's, it's quite a remarkable story. I'm a big fan of John Lennox. 
And I was wondering if you, besides Douglas Grisham, whether you've contacted others that perhaps were uh, students of his. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. John Lennox. He's a, a professor of mathematics at Oxford. Yeah. Don't know, I'm sorry about that. Unfortunately, I don't know anybody. And I, you know, one of the things I, people think that because I do C.S. Lewis, I'm a real scholar. Actually, I know quite a lot, but there are times when I'm in a C.S. Lewis conference and I'm surrounded with scholars. And the only thing I can, can sort of give myself some comfort is they know a lot about Lewis. They probably never memorized a book of Lewis and I did memorize the grief of preserved. So <laughs> that's my only thing. Well, I, I think also just to add, I mean, the, most of the scholars, of course, are fascinated by Lewis's work and his influence and the many different areas he, he wrote in and so forth um, and the whole history of that. But David is really, in, my, in our opinion, has perfected the person as well as all the different elements of the Lewis personality and success and writing and so forth. And to portray that is an incredible accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. One more. One last question. Do you take any of the... Oh, uh, what, can you wait for the microphone? I'm sure they can hear me. I, people at the back may not be able to hear you. Yeah, we're, that's all right. Just, I can hear you. Do you but, take any of the show that you do into secondary or post-secondary settings? Educational. Um, do I take it to educational facilities? Yep. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I've done um, a number of universities, a number of colleges. Um, I think the last one I did was Brigham University mm -hmm. up in... Um, Brigham Young? Yeah, we, they booked me for two performances um, at one of their theatres, 500-seat theatre. They sold them both out. So, mm -hmm. yes, I, I've done that. Um, and when, sometimes what I've done is I've had a chance to take a seminar with the students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One last quickie. One last quickie. Thank you very much. I, too, enjoyed the show. The last comment you made uh, <clears throat> led me to another question, which is when you become so heavily involved in the work of one person, how do you keep your own identity, your own sense of self separate, or do you, or do you feel that you have become Lewis, or, in, in other words, to what degree do you actually feel you've taken on this persona, as opposed to being able to step back and say, this is somebody else, I'm somebody different? Okay. Well, good question. Well, let me answer it in two ways. One, my wife doesn't think she sleeps with C.S. Lewis. <laughs> she knows she sleeps with David Payne. And two, when you ask me about when do I have a, do I, have I got the persona of Lewis, the only time I have a persona of Lewis is when I walk on stage. When I walk off stage, I'm David Payne. So I've, I've separated it. What I think I can say is that I look at Lewis and I think, that's a man to aspire to. There are so many qualities in him. I think, gosh, I wish I could be like him. I'm not the intellectual he was, but, um, but uh, so that's the answer to that. One thing I might just add is um, Lewis, as David was saying, is not a perfect person. None of us are. Um, but he, uh, in his work, was able to um, uh, exalt truth, goodness, and beauty in ways that continues to resonate. Uh, when he was alive towards the end of his life, he believed that his work would be forgotten within two or three years after his death. And um, it's more influential today than ever. So I think that's an incredible reflection. Yeah, and also him. from my point of view, the fact is that uh, when I decided to do Lewis, I came from a marketing background. And I thought, if I was going to portray somebody, who would I portray? Well, somebody who's, who people know well, whose popularity is growing uh, as the years go on, and that was Lewis. And, and um, so I'm very fortunate that I've had um, um, the opportunity to maximize Lewis's uh, popularity. And it's, it, that's, you know, I go to an era, they don't even know who David Payne is. They don't even care. But they do hope that when they see David Payne playing C.S. Lewis, that they really get C.S. Lewis, and so that's what I hope. I have this sense that one day when I get up there, <laughs> I'm going to see C.S. Lewis, as you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
And, uh, and the other thing I have, and this will end, is that up there, I, I have this sense that maybe there is theatre, you see. And one day they're putting on Shadowlands. And Jack says, oh, Shadowlands. That's about me. I'll go along and audition for the lead role. <laughs> and he goes along. And they say, oh, so sorry. We've just given the role to David Payne. <laughs> <laughs>